In this video, we're going to look at the process that you use for estimating the population mean. Um, a point estimate is a single value that's used to estimate a population parameter. Now, when we are talking about um, a population mean, the best point estimate that we can get for this is our sample mean, which is x bar. So if we had a study that found um, that from a sample of 40 coins, they had a mean weight of 5.7 grams and a standard deviation of 0.4 grams, and we were asked to find what the best estimate for the population mean for this type of coin was, we would simply use our sample mean. So because our information tells us that X bar is equal to 5.7 grams, this would be our best estimate for that particular type of coin for the population mean. Now, because we don't know how accurate our point estimates are going to be, oftentimes what we will do is we will actually um, use a confidence interval instead. And a confidence interval is a range of values that's used to estimate the true value of a population parameter. So instead of just giving a single estimate, we'll give this range of values. Now, when we're working with confidence intervals, we are going to have um, a confidence level which is the probability that the confidence interval actually does contain the population parameter. And oftentimes we will either be told the confidence level or we will do one minus alpha to figure out what our confidence level is. So what we're gonna look at now is how do we actually compute the confidence interval for the coin example? So the first thing we have to do is our re check our requirements. There's two requirements we're going to look at. The first one is that we use a simple random sample. Um, for our coins, it doesn't tell us what the sampling method was, so we are going to have to assume that it was a simple random sample. And then our second requirement is that the population is normally distributed or our sample size is greater than 30. Well, for our example, we had a sample size of 40 coins, so we've, we've met the, um, the requirement of being larger than 40, so we can, we can continue. Okay, the second thing we want to do is we want to find our critical values. Now, we have two options at this point. If our population standard deviation is unknown, which is usually the case, we are going to use the t distribution to find our critical values. And we're going to find our t alpha divided by 2, and that has degrees of freedom of n minus 1. Now, if our population standard deviation is known, then we will use the z distribution. Okay, so if we take a look at our critical values here, um, since we're doing a confidence interval, this is kind of what our generic setup looks like. And let's assume that we're going to do a 95% confidence interval for this particular problem. That 95% would be my area um, between my critical values. And then to find my, um, my other two areas, if I do 1 minus the 0.95, which would actually give me my alpha value, alpha is going to be equal to 0 0.05. Now, because I have uh, two tails here, I have area above and area below, I have to cut that in half. So my alpha divided by 2 is going to equal to 0 0.05 divided by 2, which is going to give me 0 0.025 in each of these tails. So that's where this notation of the alpha divided by 2 comes from, is because we have to take our, our alpha value and split it in half because we have a tail on the high end and a tail on the low end. So this right here, the t alpha divided by 2, is just notation. Now, at this point, if I'm going to do, um, if sigma is unknown, I'm going to go to my t distribution, and I am going to look up the critical T value for these two locations. Now we have to know our degrees of freedom and our degrees of freedom says we have to take N minus one. Well, N is our sample size, so that is 40 for our example. And when I do 40 minus one, I get 39. So at this point, I would go to my, uh, my standard T distribution table, go down to my degrees of freedom of 39 and find my critical values for the t distribution. When I do that, I end up getting 2.023, and then this one would technically be negative 2.023. So 
these would be my critical values if I were using a T distribution. Now, if I'm going to use a Z distribution, so if my population standard deviation is known, I would go to my standardized Z distribution table and I would look up the Z scores associated with the critical values. And when I do that, I end up getting Z is equal to 1.96 and then the lower end would be negative 1.96 is equal to Z. So now for, um, for examples and problems that you're doing, you will not find both of these items. You will have to decide which one you use based off of is sigma unknown or is sigma known. Okay, now for our example, our population standard deviation is unknown because the standard deviation that was given to us in the problem is the sample standard deviation. So we will actually be using the T distribution to finish out our example. Okay, once we have our critical values found, then we can find our margin of errors. Now notice our formulas here have the exact same setup, but it's a matter of are you using the T distribution, which is the first formula here, or are you using the Z distribution, which is our second formula here? We are going to continue on with the T distribution for our example. So when I want to compute my margin of error, I'm going to take my critical T value, which was 2.023, and I'm going to multiply that by my sample standard deviation, which was 0.4, divided by my square root of my sample size. So divided by the square root of 40. When I do that computation, I end up getting a margin of error that is equal to 0 0.128. Okay, now if I were using my D Z distribution, I would have the same type of setup, but I would have just my, um, my critical Z value here, and then my population standard deviation up on top there. So once we have our margin of error, now we can go ahead and we can write our confidence interval. There's three common ways to write it, um, which I have shown right here. I'm just going to go ahead and use the top one. So in order to change my margin of error and produce the confidence interval, I have to take X bar minus my error. Well, X bar, that is my sample mean, and in my problem, that was 5.7 grams. My margin of error was 0.128. So when I do that subtraction, I get 5.572 grams. Okay, and then I'm going to have is less than my population mean, which is less than. Now to get my top value of my interval, because I'm trying to make a range of values here, I'm going to take X bar plus my margin of error. So I would do 5.7 plus 0.128. When I add those together, I get 5.828. So this right here is my confidence interval for the example for the coins. I could have also chose either of these other two um, methods for writing my interval. Now when we go to interpret our confidence interval, um, the standard way that we interpret this is we would say we are 95% confident, so we want to make sure we have our confidence level in there, that the interval from, and then here's the two values that we just found, the 5.572 and the 5.828. Um, so we are 95% confident that the interval from 5.572 grams to 5.828 grams actually contains the true value of the population mean weight for that type of coin. We do not want to say that there's a 95% chance that it's between those because that would be, that would imply that it's associated with um, a probability, a random chance, and our population mean is not up to chance. It's actually a concrete value, um, so we don't want to, to use that second phrasing there. Now sometimes they are going to kind of give us the reverse of a problem. So let's say that we heard there was a 90% confidence interval for the population mean from 22.5 to 28.3 for whatever topic they're talking about. Well if they want us to find the point estimate associated with that information, we can kind of visualize this on a number line. So my lower end of my, my interval is 22.5 
and my upper end of my interval is 28.3. Now if we think about what we did for our confidence interval, we took our x bar plus our margin of error, we took our x bar minus our margin of error. Well since we are adding and subtracting the same amount each time, that's actually going to mean our x bar is right in the middle of our interval and then our margin of error is however far away we are from that middle point to the top or to the bottom. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find what is my middle value. Well in order to find the middle of two numbers I just need to find their mean. I need to find their average. So when I add them together and divide by 2 I end up getting 25.4. So for this particular example, the point estimate that was associated with the information would have been x bar is equal to 25.4 because that is the value that's right in the middle of my interval. Now the second part here, it says find the margin of error associated with the information. Well now I just need to find out how far away is my point estimate from either one of my ends. It doesn't matter which end you go to. So if I take 28.3 and minus 25.4, that's going to tell me how far away those two values are from each other. And it turns out to be 2.9. So that would be my margin of error for this um, particular example here. Okay, one other thing that they might ask you to do is to determine the sample size needed to produce a certain margin of error. Now, in this case, our formula says n is equal to the quantity. Here's our critical z value. Notice this is a z value only. We don't do a t value in this one. And we have a population standard deviation there. And then E represents our margin of error. So if they tell us that we want to make sure our margin of error is within two points, we would put that two points down here where our E is. Now this can lead to some issues because it's often the case that we do not know the population standard deviation. If that happens, we do have some, some options that we can use to estimate it. So one is we can use the range rule of thumb which says our population standard deviation is going to be about equal to the range of our data set um, divided by 4. Another thing that we can do is we can start um, collecting our sample even though we don't know how many we need to collect yet. We can start collecting our sample and then use the sample standard deviation in place of sigma and then as we um, as we collect more values getting closer to our end, we can keep adjusting that to determine what our sample size would need to be. Or we can just estimate the population standard deviation by using the results of some other study that has already been done. So if we run into a situation where they want us to determine the sample size needed, but we don't know the population standard deviation, we can, we can try one of these alternatives to help us estimate what that value would be.